Assalamu alaikum. Good afternoon. Hello, everyone. Walaikum asalam, sir. Welcome to today's webinar. I'm so glad to have all of you with me today. Uh, and today, inshallah, we are having a short free webinar in which we are going to discuss uh, what's after treating uh, uh, the gestational trophoblastic disease, how to do the follow-up, and what are the advices we can give to the patient. And after that, we are going to have uh, um, a quick review or overview about our new progressive course, uh, uh, which will help a lot of candidates to uh, get a quick revision before the exam. So uh, for all the attendants, this is Dr. Mohammed Helmi. I am the lead mentor of part one MRCG and mid-exam expert. And the entire team are so glad to have you all joining us in this free webinar. And actually, uh, I want to say why I uh, picked up this topic in particular, because there were some updates which were published uh, uh, in uh, 2020. So there were some uh, uh, in new points regarding the follow-up, especially the contraception advices which were updated in 2020. But as I know that, you know, um, part one candidates uh, who are taking the exam, some of them, you know, somehow depend on the old questions and they remember the answers from the old questions. Uh, or some of them might be, you know, fresh graduates who are not familiar with reading new guidelines or updated guidelines. So some of the old questions were answered in a certain you know, way. But of course, after the new updates, we need to update our information because the answers will be, of course, different, especially when you are talking about the uh, contraception after uh, uh, GTD. So it's a very important point to discuss together and Let's go through the points we need you to know about this topic. And as I mentioned, after that, we will have a, a, um, a short talk about our new progressive course for all candidates who want to join us for a, a quick rubber plan for the exam, inshallah. So we have two sources for today's topic. We have the Green Top Guideline, which, were, which was updated in uh, uh, September 2020, and also the Faculty of Sexual and Reproductive Healthcare Guidelines, uh, the uh, guideline about contraception after pregnancy. We know the FSRH is the uh, uh, society or the authority which uh, give the guidelines about uh, the contraception in general and all things related to the sexual health and uh, uh, reproductive health. So, uh, uh, of course, there is a collaboration between the different uh, uh, societies. And of course, when we read the Green Top guidelines, they refer to the Faculty of Sexual uh, and Reproductive Health for the updates regarding contraception after gestational trophoblastic disease. So, that's our reference, of course. And as a quick introduction, we know that GTD comprises a group of uh, uh, disorders. They contain or they include the pre-malignant conditions. We all know that the complete and partial molar pregnancies or the hydrated form moles. And also it includes the uh, malignant conditions of invasive mole, choriocarcinoma, and the rare placental side trophoblastic tumor and epithelioid trophoblastic tumors, and uh, these are considered malignant conditions. Also, the, there is another uh, uh, condition called atypical placental side nodules, but the malignant potential of that condition is still unclear. Okay, so it can uh, not be considered, you know, uh, uh, frank malignant, but the malignant potential is still unclear. So that's collectively called the GTD, gestational trophoblastic disease. When we talk about 
any evidence of persistence of GTD after primary treatment, and this is defined as persistent elevation of HCG, this is the condition which we all know about uh, as gestational trophoblastic neoplasia. Gestational trophoblastic neoplasia. So any persistence or uh, any uh, uh, constant elevation of HCG after termination of an, any pregnancy event is known as GTN. So the GTN depends mainly on the persistent elevation of HCG and it does not require histological confirmation. So we depend mainly on the persistent elevation of, uh, of HCG level uh, uh, beyond any or after any pregnancy event, of course, uh, with exclusion of a new pregnancy, I mean. So uh, that does not need or does not require histological confirmation. So quickly, the removal of a molar pregnancy. If we have a case of partial or a complete molar pregnancy, what is the method of choice to remove this abnormal pregnancy? As we all know also from the guidelines that the suction curettage is the method of choice to remove complete molar pregnancy. And that's usually done under ultrasound guidance. This is very important to minimize the chance of perforation and also to ensure that as much tissue as possible is removed. So we depend mainly on doing suction curettage under ultrasound guidance. This, this is the method of choice when we deal with complete molar pregnancy. It's not wise to go through the medical removal. It should be avoided when we deal with a case of complete molar pregnancy because the risk of developing GTN and requiring chemotherapy is 16 fold higher when medical methods of removal are used in cases of complete molar pregnancy. As we, as we know, and I'm going to mention in a while that the chances of GTN are generally increased after complete molar pregnancy than the partial molar pregnancy. So it's better to do, to do a complete removal by suction curettage and ultrasound guidance for cases of complete molar pregnancy and try to avoid the medical removal. Uh, this is associated with a 16 fold higher uh, uh, risk of having or developing GTN and requiring chemotherapy. So what about the partial molar pregnancy? Also, we will say that the suction curettage is the method of choice, but except if the size of the fetal parts prevents the use of suction curettage, so we here can go through or we can use the medical removal. So we know that in cases of partial molar pregnancy, we might have a, <clears throat> a fetus, which shows, of course, uh, uh, multiple congenital anomalies and signs of triploidy. So this uh, fetal parts may deter or prevent the proper use of suction curettage. So here it's, uh, uh, um, of course, uh, uh, as a consequence, we will have or we will be obliged to use the medical methods for termination of pregnancy in cases of uh, 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 a partial molar pregnancy. What's, main, what's the meaning by medical removal? Like the medical induction of labor or the, sorry, medical induction of a portion, like giving prostaglandins, I mean, and to wait for the uterus to expel the contents uh, uh, by uh, uterine contractions. We will use the prostaglandins to initiate the dilatation of the cervix and the uterine contractions to help the uterus to expel the products of conception. Am I clear so far, everyone? Yes, sir. Dr. Aisha Khalid is complaining of having black screen. You please, you check your uh, connection. Can you uh, see everyone the slides? Uh, yeah, we can see the slides. Okay, very good. Okay, so that's what 
to do when we remove the, the, the molar pregnancy in cases of complete or, more, or partial molar pregnancy. Also for twin pregnancies, sometimes we have twin pregnancies where there is a non-molar pregnancy alongside a molar pregnancy. So in, in such situation, also if the size of the fetal parts deters the use of suction curettage, medical removal also can be used. So we can use the medical methods in case of having twin pregnancies. Sometimes there is a non-molar pregnancy alongside the molar pregnancy, and if the woman decided to terminate the pregnancy or there has been demise of the coexisting twin and the side of the fetal parts prevents the use of suction curettage, medical removal can be used. Also regarding the, the recommendations for ripening of the cervix with either physical dilators or prostaglandins, prior to the uterine removal, this can be done as it's not associated with an increased risk of developing GTN. So if even if you want to do suction curettage and you see that the cervix is not well dilated or it's narrow and you want to make a physical dilatation of the cervix like using Hager's dilators or to give some prostaglandins prior to the uterine removal procedure, that's can be done without increased risk of developing GTM. So uh, uh, that's also a very important uh, uh, recommendation. Dr. Manel, please check your connection. Other colleagues can see the slides. So that might be because of something regarding your connection. Okay, so <clears throat> what about the use of oxytocin infusion? during the procedure of uh, 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 the removal of the product of conception during a molar pregnancy. Actually, to give an oxytocin infusion prior to completion of the removal is not recommended. And the justification of this recommendation that there is a potentiality to uh, impolize and disseminate the trophoblastic tissue through the venous system. And this can lead to adult respiratory distress syndrome similar in presentation with the amniotic fluid impulse. So it's not a wise decision to get an oxytocin infusion before completing uh, uh, the uh, uh, procedure of uterine uh, uh, removal or uterine evacuation because the trophoblastic tissue may uh, uh, might embolize or disseminate through the circulation, which can lead to showers of pulmonary embolism uh, uh, leading to an adult respiratory distress syndrome, and that's very similar in presentation with the amniotic fluid impulse. However, if a woman is experiencing significant hemorrhage prior to or during removal of uh, uh, the uh, uh, molar pregnancy, we need to expedite or fasten the surgical removal, and here we might consider giving oxytocin infusion, but we have to, uh, uh, you know, uh, know that there is a risk. The risk will be uh, uh, weighed up against the benefit or the benefit of oxytocin, oxytocin infusion and preventing the bleeding will be weighed up against the risk of tissue embolization. So that's an, a, a certain situation in which we might consider using uh, an oxytocin infusion if the woman is experiencing significant bleeding, but we have also to appear in our mind that we still have the risk of tissue embolization. Is my voice clear, everyone? <clears throat> okay. Yeah, your voice is clear. Thank you. Okay. Excuse me, the voice is uh, it's not too clear. It's uh, still uh, down. Could you please raise your voice? Okay, I, I'm, I'm, my voice is normal here, but you might have something regarding the voice, the volume level uh, from your device. Please check it, okay? <clears throat> I'm near my mic. Okay. So, 
Okay, other colleagues are uh, uh, clarifying that the voice is very clear, so I'm going to proceed. What about the anti D prophylaxis? What about the anti D prophylaxis? That's also a very important issue here. So we know that the D the, the, the antigens are carried on the red blood cells. So in cases of complete molar pregnancy, if we are talking about a scientific justification or a scientific explanation, in complete molar pregnancy, there is very poor vascularization of the chorionic villi. And the D antigen is actually absent. It's not carried by the trophoblastic cells. Means that scientifically, that the anti-D prophylaxis is not required for cases of complete molar pregnancy. Here I'm talking about the scientific background, but, but we know that to make sure that that's a complete molar pregnancy, we need a histopathological confirmation after evacuation of the uh, 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 content of the pregnancy or uh, after evacuation of the product of conception. That's to make sure 100% or to confirm that it's a complete molar pregnancy, we do, of course, a histopathological examination of the removed content from the uterus. That's in most of the uh, uh, um, you know, uh, centers or in most of the uh, uh, lab laboratories, this uh, is difficult to be established within 72 hours. So here we give the anti-D prophylaxis for practical reasons. Why? Because we still might have some doubts that there may might be some uh, fetal tissues which uh, 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 or fetal uh, um, cells, which is, of course, uh, uh, not uh, uh, well uh, diagnosed by ultrasound prior to the evacuation, and it might appear to be a partial molar pregnancy, not complete molar pregnancy. So here we are going to put the woman at a risk of uh, uh, sensitization. So if we are not sure that the histopathology will not be available within 72 hours, so uh, will be available within 72 hours. So we have to give the anti-D prophylaxis for practical reasons as a matter of safety for the patient. But if we are sure 100% that we will get the histopathology report within the three days or within the 72 hours, then we might uh, uh, wait until the results. But I don't think this will be practical because I know most of the centers, most of the labs will give you the result in uh, um, five to seven days. So it's better to give the anti-D prophylaxis if you are not sure that you are going to get the histopathology report within 72 hours. But of course, uh, it will be required for all cases of partial molar pregnancies. Am I clear everyone so far? <clears throat> Yes, sir. Yes. Okay. So there are also some points we need to put in our mind when we deal about uh, uh, termination of pregnancy in cases of miscarriage or in cases of therapeutic abortion. Also, it's wise to do histological assessment of cases or in, uh, in situations uh, uh, where we face a case of miscarriage. It's better after evacuating the uterus, whether by medical methods or by surgical methods, to do histological assessment. Of course, the histological assessment will confirm the result if it's, if it's that was a normal pregnancy or if there are signs of molar pregnancy or not. But if there is no tissue has been sent to pathology, so you have to do a pregnancy test after three weeks of miscarriage. You have to do a pregnancy test after three weeks of miscarriage. If the level is not falling, so you have to arrange for ultrasound because this might be a case of gestational trophoplastic neoplasia. So that's very important. If you do not uh, uh, send a histopathology uh, uh, sample, after miscarriage, you have to do a pregnancy test after three weeks. If the level is not falling, you have to arrange for ultrasound to uh, uh, exclude uh, any events of gestational trophoplastic neoplasia. So that's after miscarriage. So what about after therapeutic abortion? If a woman is 
terminating her pregnancy due to any medical or any social reasons, okay? So if the fetal parts have been uh, uh, identified very well during ultrasound or during the surgical abortion, so no need for routine histological examination. So if the woman was, you know, uh, doing an ultrasound uh, at, the, at her early pregnancy, and you clearly define that there was a fetus, the fetal parts were clearly identified, or if you identify the fetal parts during the surgical abortion, so no need for routine histological examination. It's enough to do a urinary pregnancy test three weeks after medical abortion. And if you notice that the level also is not falling, you have to arrange for an ultrasound to exclude the woman having GTN. So also this, this is a very important, uh, a good practice point when, we, when you deal with cases of miscarriage or therapeutic abortion. So what about the follow-up after molar pregnancy, after a woman uh, um, completely evacuated her molar pregnancy for how long she should uh, uh, have a follow-up program. So first of all, any woman diagnosed with GTD should be provided with written information about her condition and she should be registered in one of the GTD centers. Of course, when we talk about the UK, there are uh, three GTD centers, one in, in London, one in Sheffield, and one in Dundee. So she should be referred to one of these uh, GTD uh, centers and she should uh, be followed up or have a follow-up program with these centers. So the outcome for these women with the GTN and GTD will be better if she takes a good care from these GTD centers. So what about the follow-up? program after evacuation. Regarding the complete molar pregnancy, if the HCG reverted to normal within 56 days of the pregnancy event, so this woman will need a follow-up for six months from the date of the uterine evacuation, from the date of uterine evacuation. So her follow-up will be for six months from the date in which she had her uterine evacuation. That's in case the HCG reverted to normal within 56 days of pregnancy. If the HCG has not reverted to normal within 56 days of the pregnancy event, or by another meaning, it became normal, but after 56 days, so you have to give her a follow-up plan for six months from the date of normalization of the HCG level. So if the HCG level normalization was delayed after 56 days. So you have to give her a follow-up plan for six months from the day she got normal HCG levels. So that's for complete molar pregnancy. What about partial molar pregnancy? The follow-up is completed once we have two HCG uh, 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 normal levels or once the HCG has returned to normal on two samples at least four weeks apart. So we finish the follow-up plan for Martian molar pregnancy when we have normal HCG in two samples at least four weeks apart. So that will be the follow-up plan for cases of a, a molar pregnancy after evacuating the molar pregnancy, of course. What about the GTN? If a woman develops GTN after any pregnancy event, so after evacuation of a complete molar pregnancy, approximately 15 to 20% of women go on to develop GTN requiring chemotherapy, while the risk after partial molar pregnancy is much lower, and this is about 0.5 to 1%. If the HCG levels spontaneously revert to normal after uterine evacuation, the risk of post-molar GTN has been reported as only 0.4%. So if the HCG levels spontaneously revert to normal after uterine evacuation without the need of any chemotherapy, usually the risk of post-molar pregnancy will be very low. But generally speaking, the complete molar pregnancy has higher risk of developing post-molar GTN 
than the partial molar pregnancy. So how are we going to deal with such patients? We have to deal with such patients after stratifying them or classifying them into low risk and high risk according to what's called the FIGO 2000 scoring system. This scoring system depends on certain parameters, including the age of the woman, the, pre the previous pregnancy event, the interval or the period between the index pregnancy to the start of treatment, the pre-treatment serum HCG levels, the tumor size, the size of metastasis and number of metastases, and the history of any previously failed chemotherapy. When we deal with part one in surgery, or when we talk about the part one in surgery level, it's not mandatory to you know, know all the uh, uh, parameters of the scoring system, except of course, those colleagues who are going through part two, of course, they have to know every details in these guidelines. But generally speaking, after giving the score to the woman, we will have two categories. Women with scores of sex or less are considered at low risk. They are considered low risk women. So these women will be treated with single agent intramuscular methotrexate alternating daily with folinic acid for one week, then followed by six rest days. So, and then start another cycle and so on. So women for, uh, 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 or with low risk, I mean that their scores are six or less, so are going to be treated by single agent intramuscular methotrexate. One day I'm going to give intramuscular methotrexate, the next day uh, uh, folinic acid, then the third day um, methotrexate, the fourth day folinic acid, and so on for one week. Then we are going to give her six rest days, then start another cycle and so on until the treatment is completely uh, done or finished. For the women with scoring seven or more, they are considered high risk. So these women need to be treated with multiple agent chemotherapy, intravenous multi-agent chemotherapy. This is including methotrexate, actinomycin, D, etobozide, cyclophosphamide, or vencrestin, which is also called oncoven. That's another name of vencrestin. So this combination is known as the IMACO. The IMACO is the abbreviation of etobozide, methotrexate, actinomycin, and cyclophosphamide and oncoven. That's a multi-agent intravenous chemotherapy for those women scoring seven or more, or uh, which we call, or who we call, I mean, uh, high-risk women. In both cases, whether I'm dealing with low-risk women or high-risk women, the treatment will continue until the HCG level has returned to normal and then for a further six consecutive weeks. So I'm going to continue the treatment until the HCG level has returned to normal, then for a further six consecutive weeks. The cure rate for women with scoring sex or less, I mean the low-risk women, the cure rate is almost 100%, while for the high-risk women is about 94%. The placental cytoplastic tumor and epithelioid tumors are uh, uh, now recognized as variants on GTN. In such situations, we may need to treat the woman with surgical methods. Uh, I mean that uh, she might go for uh, even hysterectomy because uh, these women are uh, less sensitive to chemotherapy. So if you try chemotherapy with these, with these kind of tumors, the placental site or epithelial tumors, and they were resistant completely to the chemotherapy in such cases to avoid the malignancy sequelae for the moment we might proceed for surgery. So that's how to deal with the cases of GTM according to the score. Also, there are some precautions regarding choriocarcinoma. We need more extensive investigations in cases of choriocarcinoma. We need to do for the woman CT chest and abdomen, MRI for the head and pelvis, uh, and also we need to do Doppler ultrasound of the pelvis to check for signs of metastasis. That's in cases of choriocarcinoma. So choriocarcinoma need more extensive investigations. Also, we have to bear in our mind that women with a score of 13 or greater 
is uh, at a very high risk of early death within four weeks of the condition because of the uh, um, bleeding into organs or multi-drug resistant disease. Sometimes when the score is very high, especially if the woman is having a previous history of uh, uh, previously failed chemotherapy, this, these women are at high risk of death because uh, uh, of the, uh, the, the, you know, delayed condition in such situation or uh, uh, because of the uh, extensive metastasis, which leads to bleeding into the different organs. So these are also some points we have to consider when we deal with the case of GTN. Am I clear so far, everyone? <clears throat> Yes, sir. So good. So far. Okay. Okay. That's great. So what about future pregnancy and fertility? So what are the advices that we are going to give for a woman regarding her future pregnancy and future fertility? So regarding the molar pregnancy, when we talk about a case of molar pregnancy, or any case of a, 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 a gestational trophoblastic disease, any woman should be advised not to conceive until their follow-up is complete. Of course, if it's an ordinary molar pregnancy, I mean, it's not a GTN, she is not taking chemotherapy. So once her follow-up plan is completed, she can uh, uh, start planning for pregnancy. And women who have a pregnancy uh, following a previous molar pregnancy, which has not required treatment for GTN, do not need to send a post-pregnancy HCG sample. By another meaning, if you are dealing with a woman who is having a molar pregnancy, you evacuated the uterus, she had her follow-up plan uh, uh, smoothly without any problems, and she didn't need any kind of chemotherapy, you don't have to send post-pregnancy HCG, HCG samples for the subsequent pregnancies. So if she got pregnant again with a normal pregnancy and everything went very well, no need to follow up her after the healthy pregnancy. And even that's uh, uh, no need also to send any histological examination of the placental tissue from any normal pregnancy after a molar pregnancy. So she got a molar pregnancy, she had a smooth follow-up plan without any problem. She didn't need any kind of chemotherapy. After that, she had a healthy pregnancy. After that healthy pregnancy, you don't have to do follow-up HCG levels or to send any histological examination of the placenta. Also, when we counsel the woman, we have to tell her that the risk of a further moral pregnancy after a molar pregnancy is uh, low, approximately 1%. And of course, it will be higher with complete molar pregnancy than partial molar pregnancy. That's a very important point in counseling the patient. You know, that's a fundamental point when, uh, inshallah, you uh, go through part three, Mars regime, and you have a station when we counsel a woman who is having a molar pregnancy. And one of the important questions the patient is going to ask you, what is her risk of having a further molar pregnancy? You have to tell her that, one in 100 women will have a further molar pregnancy, and that will be, of course, uh, more evident with having a, a complete molar pregnancy than partial molar pregnancy. I mean that if the woman is having complete molar pregnancy, you expect the recurrence uh, uh, will be higher for her than another woman who had a partial molar pregnancy. Clear, everyone? Yes, sir. Okay, very good. So <clears throat> if a woman, what if a woman needed chemotherapy? I mean, she was diagnosed with having GTN and she needed chemotherapy. So women who undergo chemotherapy are advised not to conceive for one year after completion of treatment. Of course, that's very important to avoid the uh, side effects, the uh, teratogenic effects of the chemotherapy. So it's better to recommend the woman or advise her not to conceive until one year after completion of her treatment. Also, this will be uh, one of the uh, worrying questions 
uh, the woman will be worried about, about her further pregnancies or about her further uh, uh, fertility. You are going to counsel the woman that further pregnancies are achieved in approximately 80% of the women following treatment of GTN with either methotrexate alone or even with multi-agent chemotherapy. So 80% 80 of the women will have normal healthy pregnancies after treating uh, GTN. But also there might be some sort of increased risk of premature menopause, especially in those women who are treated with high doses of multiple agent chemotherapy. You have to counsel these women that their periods even might stop during the course of treatment. And there might be some sort of risks if they are taking very high doses for these multiple agents chemotherapy that they might uh, uh, go into a, a, a premature ovarian insufficiency or premature menopause. This is about 13% of the women will have premature menopause by the age of 40 years and 36 by the percent by the age of 45 years. But this is in cases they are taking high doses of multiple agent chemotherapy. Generally speaking, 80% will have normal healthy pregnancies after chemotherapy. So we are advising the women who are having molar pregnancy not to conceive after completing their follow-up and those treated with chemotherapy not to conceive until uh, completing one year after the treatment. So of course, this will bring us to an important point. You have to offer them contraception. So what are the main advices regarding contraception and generally about hormonal therapies? The most important thing regarding contraception and that's uh, uh, regarding the Faculty of Sexual and Reproductive Health Guidelines. Dr. Maria, which slide please? This one. This one. Yes, sir. Yes, what is the problem? Thank you, you sir. Thank you. Okay, okay. So regarding the contraception advice, so women should be informed about the effectiveness of different contraceptive methods, including the superior effectiveness of LARC, which is, which is the abbreviation of long-acting reversible contraception, when choosing an appropriate method to use after GTD. So any, kind, any type of contraception, or we have different methods of contraception, which can be very effective after a GTD event, with superior effectiveness of the long-acting reversible contraception. So women should be advised that most methods of contraception can be safely used after treatment of GTD. And that can be started immediately after uterine evacuation with the exception of intrauterine contraception. So we have certain precautions for intrauterine contraceptions. Whether I'm talking about the intrauterine contraceptive device, the intrauterine cover device, I mean, or if I'm talking about the levonorgestrel intrauterine system. So the UK medical eligibility criteria advises that women who have GTD can safely use progestogen only contraception like the implant or the injectable contraceptions or the progesterone only pill. Also the combined hormonal contraception, whether I'm talking about the combined pills or the transdermal patches or the vaginal rings or diaphragm are also can be safely used. And these methods, as clearly mentioned by the guidelines, can be initiated on the same day as uterine evacuation for GTD. And that's one of the points which uh, uh, was uh, which were amended 
in the 2020 guidelines that previously, and if you check the old questions regarding giving uh, the combined pills, uh, which contain estrogen and progesterone, there was a very famous question which was repeated frequently in the exam. When you start giving combined pills, and of course the key answer was when the HCG level returns to normal. That's, that was an old recommendation. And the justification at that time was because they thought that the estrogen uh, might increase the risk of developing GTN and also uh, it might interfere with the proper follow-up of the HCG levels. But of course, the recent studies have showed that the, the, there is no evidence that estrogen will increase the risk of GTN and it will not interrupt the follow-up plan so we can start combined hormonal contraception also from the day of the uterine evacuation for the GTD. So all methods can be used safely from the day of evacuation, except the intrauterine contraception. It's better to avoid the uh, insertion of intrauterine devices uh, in women with persistently elevated HCG levels, or if there is any evidence of malignant disease, because this will increase the risk of uterine perforation. At certain conditions, we might uh, consider inserting the intrauterine con contraception if a woman is wishing to, but if we are sure that the HCG levels are decreasing. And that's not a rule. That's not a rule. This is should be done after uh, uh, an extensive discussion with a GTD center. So if uh, there is any indication for insertion and intratrine contraception, we must make sure first that the HCG levels are decreasing and also we need a multidisciplinary discussion with a GTD center. But for the exam, as a general rule, the recommendation do not, in, do not insert the intratrine contraception device except the HCG, except after having normal HCG levels. And of course, after excluding any malignant disease. Of course, that's the UK medical eligibility criteria and they divide the, uh, the criteria into category one, two, three, four. One means that the method is completely safe to be used. Two mean that the advantage of the method outweigh the risk. Con condition three or category three mean that the risk outweigh the benefit. So to provide the method, we have uh, uh, to uh, make an extensive discussion first. Category four mean that there will be an unacceptable health risk from the method, so it should be completely avoided. So if you can see here, if uh, 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 or when we talk about the implant or the injectable progesterone uh, contraception or the progesterone only pills or the combined hormonal contraception, they all take the uh, uh, category one. So they are completely safe in cases of uh, uh, undetectable HCG level or in cases of decreasing HCG levels or increasing or persistent elevated or malignant disease. So these methods can be completely safely used in all situations of GTD. But when we talk about the intrauterine contraception, whether copper or levonorgestrel, they will take the score of one. They will be only safely or completely safe to be used once the HCG levels become completely undetectable. If the levels are decreasing, they take the score of three. Still, the risk outweigh the benefit. So we need extensive discussion before considering them. If, they if the there is still persistent elevated HCG levels or malignant disease, they will take the score of four. So that means that they are completely unacceptable in this condition. Clear, everyone? <clears throat> yes, sir. Okay, very good. Regarding also the emergency contraception, we know that we have oral emergency contraception and we have the uh, intratrine copper device. So for cases of GTD, in case of unprotected sexual intercourse, of course, simply we will uh, uh, consider the oral emergency uh, uh, contraception in the form of levonorgestrel or olprostat acetate are safe to use 
after uh, uh, GTD. So if you uh, uh, do not start the, uh, uh, the contraception within five days of the treatment of GTD, the woman will need uh, an emergency contraception if unprotected sexual intercourse happens. So emergency contraception is indicated if unprotected sexual intercourse takes place from five days after treating of GTD. So if you wait for five days after evacuating the molar pregnancy and you didn't start the routine contraception and the woman had unprotected sexual intercourse, in that time, you need to give her emergency contraception. But if you started already the uh, uh, routine contraception from the day of uterine evacuation or within five days from the evacuation, so the emergency contraception will not be needed. Of course, you do not uh, uh, recommend to insert a copper IUD for emergency contraception, except also if the levels are decreasing. And this is also need an extensive discussion with a GTD center. So women should be advised that additional contraceptive precautions like barrier methods are required if hormonal contraception is started five days or more after treating for GTD. Additional contraceptive precaution is not required if contraception is initiated immediately or within five days of treating of the GTD. So we have a safe zone of five days. After evacuating the uterus, you have to start the contraception on the day of evacuation or within five days of the evacuation. So in such situation, you don't have to advise the woman about any additional contraceptive precautions like barrier methods, and there is no need for any emergency contraception if unprotected sexual intercourse occurs in that time. But if you start the hormonal contraception five days or more, you have to advise the woman to take uh, uh, some precautions like barrier methods. And if the woman is having unprotected sexual intercourse, you will ask her to take an emergency contraception. The last point I want to say today about the fertility drugs, some women might experience uh, uh, secondary infertility or something like that, and you might consider using some fertility drugs or exogenous estrogens that's completely safe once the HCG levels have returned to normal. Also, the hormone replacement therapy for the women who are experiencing menopausal symptoms uh, uh, may be used also once the HCG levels have returned to normal. So, these are the recommendations I want all of you to know regarding the uh, follow-up plan after GTD okay. and what are the okay. advices to give to the woman regarding the future pregnancy, future fertility, what about the contraception. I hope that's clear, everyone, of course. Uh, if you have any questions, I will be happy to listen. And uh, in a while, uh, our course manager and coordinator, Mafia, will uh, uh, talk about the progressive course and also are going to answer any queries you have uh, regarding uh, our plans for uh, the uh, exams, inshallah, regarding the exam expert. Any questions or feedback? <clears throat> Very nice question, Dr. Alimi. Yes, who's talking? Sadia. Hello, Dr. Sadia. How are you? Fine, fine. Do you have any questions or feedback? Have a very nice session I have. Thank you so much. I joined late um, so because I decided late to give this exam. I haven't studied yet. So I, I want you to know that the smart way to study fast. Is... You want to know what? The way uh, the fast the start with these things. Huh? I joined late. Yes, yes. We, we, we started talking about immediately about our topic today. 
uh, we now are going to talk about the, the course and so if you are asking about uh, any scientific information you will have uh, the recording will be available on our uh, youtube channel okay if you want something about studying we are going to now to discuss about uh, things related to studying and so yeah Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, Hello, sir. I... Yes. Uh, hope you are good. Actually, I'm planning to appear in January 23 batch, and I want a quick revision. Do you have any plan for it? Um, I think it's just a caution. So, um, Asma, can you please shake the mic with the participant? Well, I, I can't. I can't listen. Yeah, actually, there is some distortion. Yeah, thank you. Yes. So she was basically uh, asking for some, uh, you know, revision course, Doctor Helmi. Yes, yes, that's that's what that's the second part of our webinar now. The, what, Mafia will talk about the progress, of course, we are having. That's a, a quick course in which we are uh, offering you a, a quick revision plan for the exam, inshallah. Yeah. Uh, so can I share my screen, Dr. Helm, if you allow, please? Yes, of course, Mafia, go on. Thank you, thank you. My screen is visible, everybody? Yes, Maka, yes. Thank you so very much. So uh, the very important thing is the revision. Why the all know that revision is not uh, just the reading thing, but it's the main important points that you note in your sessions and every I think uh, before sitting in your exam, you have to wrap up your, uh, like whatever is your preparation, for that we have launched a progressive course on uh, because we are uh, since very long we are uh, listening from the student side vision course so our mentor panel help us in uh, preparing this uh, course for you for all of you so uh, what you can do is there are some live sessions a revision live session for all the modules what you have to do is we will of all the modules modules means all the subjects for example if there is anatomy there is uh, pharmacology biostats what is soever you will get the recorded lectures of all the uh, modules uh, if you want to revise any of the topic from them you can do that after revising uh, those topics we have uh, made a uh, schedule and in those particular schedule we have uh, mentioned some uh, days like for example if there is a week one week one we have to revise some uh, particular you can say um, subject let's say in week one we have to revise anatomy uh, biochemistry biostat so what uh, what we're going to do that you uh, the students will come uh, they will just uh, see the recorded lectures and uh, they will revise all their uh, material reg regarding to that, those particular subjects. After that, they will come in their live sessions. They will ask their mentor if there is any confusion. Dr. Helmi, Dr. Mavish and Dr. Desi will gonna help you all uh, in solving your queries regarding those subjects in the live sessions. After that, what you have to do is you have to do the topic test. Topic text uh, tests mean that uh, we have some module wise question bank. Like, for example, if there is anatomy, we, you have to revise the recorded lectures of anatomy, then you have to solve the test or Q bank of anatomy. And then after revising all those, you have to come in the live session in the prepared manner. Then you have to ask your mentor if there is any question. Then Dr. Helmi and other mentors will definitely going to help you all. After that session, uh, there will be, if you have still any queries, if you need still some guidance, mentors will help you in the study group as well. Once you have done with all the modules, all the subjects, we will have an uh, important exam like workshop. And in those particular, um, in that particular workshop, you have to, uh, you can do all the recalls. You can do uh, the past five year recalls in the those workshop. After that, we will have a big mock. And after that big mock, you will be prepared for your exam. And if you still have any query, you can ask your mentor till the day of the, your exam, your all mentors will be with you so that if there is any confusion till the day, you can ask your mentor. So all those 
who are attending this webinar, they are 50% off for 24 hours. If you want to avail this opportunity, you have to just drop in a message on our Facebook page or any customer support number. We have mentioned the number here as well. You can see that in the poster, the number is mentioned and in the slides number I mentioned as well. So if you have any query, you can ask right away. So there is an exclusive uh, discount for the core students as well because we have some 200 plus students in our regular course as well. So we have just given them an opportunity. They can get, uh, you know, 50% off on the, uh, like they can get this discount till the exam day, but for the attendees of the webinar, they can get the 50% off for 24 hours only. If you have still any question, you can ask me. Yeah, actually schedule is already shared. Um, uh, you can just drop in, uh, Fatma has just shared her number. You can just drop in a message. I will share the um, schedule with you all. If uh, even in the study group, we have shared the schedule as well. So if any question, you can just open up your mic and you can ask. Yeah, uh, the cost is dollar two fifty, but on discount you can um, get it on the maximum. You can just uh, contact on the given number. Fatma will help you in this. Okay. Yeah, Fatma just shared her number. You can just uh, drop in a message. A message she will assist you. There is any other question, please, you can ask. We have just 10 more minutes to wind up the uh, session. So, yeah. Abra, sorry, I can't understand your question. Can you please write it again? All the exam or MCQs? Yes, yes, all the years. I think Dr. Abra means all the previous yeah. years. Yes, yes. Yes, yes, all the exam year questions. <clears throat> It's a complete course, actually. You don't need to uh, go anywhere. You What you have to do is you just have to get a one course and uh, under an umbrella, you will get all the things. Your question banks, your recalls, your recorded lectures, your revision sessions, each and everything will be provided. Yes, actually, like Mafia said, it will be, you know, uh, um, a very extensive revision plan. You know, we are uh, having a very strict plan so uh, those uh, colleagues who are really serious to take up the January exam and they know that they need extensive revision, you can join us. Actually, uh, as Mafia said, we will have like a bundles. The first bundle, for example, will be two or three subjects. You will get a, a few days before the live session, uh, um, a week or more. Okay, you are going to get the access to the recordings of that subject. And also the mentor will provide you by a, a schedule for that week, how to study, which topics to cover each day. So you are going to have also a guidance. You don't need even to uh, put your own schedule. You have to just follow up the schedule are going to give you. And you are going to access the recordings. You are going to study very well. Then you are going to have a live session with the mentor. The mentor will discuss with you or revise the most important things, will answer with you many questions and also respond to all of your queries. After that, immediately, you will get an access to the topic test to finalize the bundle and then to move to the next bundle and so on until finishing the course. Then you are going to get a workshop, an extensive workshop for the exam-like questions or the past uh, papers. After that, uh, uh, you will get all the support you need from the mentors in the study room, of course, in a daily. So it will be a very good chance to revise. Exactly, Doctor. Uh, Doctor Helmi, Doctor Sam is asking that she's new here, so she just needs some guidance. Uh, she, as due to timing, I'm unable to. Attend. Yeah, if you are unable to attend the live sessions, no problem is at all. All the sessions are being recorded. You can just watch it on the on our website at any time at your ease. You can watch it, no problem at all. And if watching, like if you are uh, watching the recordings of the sessions, and still if you face any issue, you just have to just write away just. Write it in your study group. Our mentors and moderators are 24 by 7 available. They will help you out. No worries at all. Yeah, please. Uh, I have a query. Yeah, uh, please. As do I'm this. already enrolled in a regular course. 
So yeah. what is the benefit for, from this uh, progressive course for those who are already uh, enrolled in a regular course? Sam, you have to wrap up your revision, right? So it's just a revision course. And to wrap up your all the, uh, you can say, uh, your preparation, you have to revise it. So it is particularly designed in a manner just to help, uh, just to wrap up your revisions, OK? OK. So you can't even, even uh, Dr. Helmi will agree with this uh, because uh, when I was a student, even uh, you can't go in the exam without even wrapping up your um, preparation because there are so many things, there are so many important points in which you have to highlight. So for that purpose, we have this, uh, we have created this course on even this course is uh, created on the demand of the students because previously we haven't launched this course. This course is just for this batch exclusively. So, uh, so that they can get the maximum benefit because we already, we, everyone knows that we have already submitted a heavy amount of fees in the exam. So uh, why should we waste that money? So just uh, to, you can say that just to secure that thing, we have just planned this course so that you can get a maximum benefit and in one go, you can clear your exam. It's right, totally up to you. Inshallah. inshallah, inshallah. Yeah, it's totally up to you. There is no offense. If you wanna take the course, you can take. If not, you think that you can do it your own self, you, it's totally up to you. Yeah, revision is including Dr. Rabia. This is a revision course, basically. Timing will be shared. You can just drop in a message on the number uh, given. Fatma has just shared her number. She will give you the schedule as well. You can see the timings, okay? Thank you. Okay, I think Dr. Saima, I, she is you know, talking about the, uh, the timing of the live sessions in the progressive course. Actually, Dr. Saima, we, um, of course, we are giving the course from different countries. As you know, I'm here in Egypt, Dr. Desiree is in Saudi Arabia, Dr. Mewish is in Pakistan. So of course we have time differences. So we have to choose some timing which suits everyone. Plus, of course, you know, uh, we as mentors also uh, have some commitments with, the, with the, our hospitals, with our clinics. So uh, the timing, you know, is based on the best suitable time for the mentors and also for most of the uh, colleagues everywhere. So. Uh, uh, we will have only we have five bundles, uh, so you try to make you know some time to uh, to attend the five live sessions. Uh, otherwise, the revision on the study room will be throughout the the whole day. So there, there will be questions shared. You can share anything uh, whenever you want, and you tag the mentor. The mentor will uh, uh, immediately answer your question. Inshallah. So, Dr. Amani, MedExam is offering you some, you know, some discount because you are already one of the regular course uh, colleagues. So, if you want to join the the progressive course, it's okay for you. If you if you still want uh, guidance and someone to help you in the uh, remaining time for the exam, it's okay. Yeah, actually, uh, Dr. Amani, mm -hmm. it's totally up to you. If you think that you still need some guidance, you still need some uh, revision, you can join the course. Otherwise, if you think that your preparation is enough, then you can just stick to the irregular course, okay? Thank you. You are most welcome, thank you. Yeah, actually, uh, yeah, just doc as Dr. Mavish just said that the workshop will be the part of the progressive course and it will be a five days workshop. What you have to do is just take five days off from your um, work routine and just need to focus on that. That will be enough for your, uh, you can say that your exams as well. Uh, hello, uh, Masha. Dr. Mavish, I'm here. Hi, uh, Dr. Mavish, how are you doing? First, you, Dr. Hale, it was a very, very good session. Um, yeah, it's a wonderful. Sorry, one. my baby is just shouting in the background. <laughs> Actually, I'm saying that uh, the students who are having difficulty in managing uh, the live sessions, I'm just saying if they are getting the progressive course, they can take five off days for live sessions only. So when yes, you will exactly. provide the schedule to them, when you will provide the schedule to them, so what they can do, they can take 
uh, they're off from their work and uh, they can attend that session because that session would be five to six hours long. And I think that uh, if one person is working at that day and he's taking that much long session, uh, he will not retain the knowledge we are trying to giving them. So it, it's just a suggestion because not everybody is enlightened to uh, get an off uh, so easily. So it's just a suggestion that if they can take five days uh, off from the work, they can attend the sessions really easily. And yes, the five days workshop is another thing which we are offering right before the exam, which Mafia has elaborated. My baby is uh, making a lot of noise, so I just have to um, put it on the mute. Actually, okay, I was explaining so, my point. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Okay, so Dr. Uh, Dr. Dr. Samia, Dr. Samia uh, is asking if this course is a revision course only. Yes, the progressive course is a revision course. Yeah. So you will not get the benefit except if you, uh, uh, at, you know, uh, make use of the week before the live session. You have to study to listen to the recording to get the benefit from the live session. For Dr. Sadia is asking in the next session, of course, from time to time, mid exam is offering free webinars. So, of course, uh, uh, the next one. Uh, I think will be soon, inshallah, and the med exam. Yeah, uh, I just wanted to add one thing. Uh, we have a next session on November 9. It will be of Dr. Mavis session. So uh, we will, uh, yes. if the poster will be up on our page as well. Please follow our uh, official page. So you will be updated for uh, which is the next session and all that. Okay, thank you. Yeah, we will have a booking guidance as well, Dr. Sadia. Um, on the booking, we have a separate webinar that how to book the exam and the guidance regarding the booking. We will uh, do that on 9th of November, inshallah. So you can join that. It's, uh, it's of 9th of November, 11 a.m. GMT. So we will share the details with you all. Okay, thank you. Any more questions? No, sir, thanks. Okay, Mafia, I think. Yeah, um, I think they, we have to wrap up. Yeah, uh, yeah, we have answered almost all the questions. So thank you so very much for joining in. So if you have any query, we have shared the number. If you don't, if you ha don't have any number, you can just go to our official page. It's on Facebook with Med Exam Expert, and the number is shared on the posters as well. You can just drop in a message, and if you have any query, you can just ask. Okay. Thank you so very much, everybody, for joining in. Thank you so much, Dr. Rabia. Thank you so much, everyone, and see you soon. See you soon all. Thank you. Goodbye.